Hello, everybody. Welcome to Adventures in Publishing. <laughs> um, this is a panel uh, that has brought together uh, a variety of publishers and editors, um, kind of across the spectrum, um, from the very small um, to the to the quite large. Um, did I break it? <laughs> Shit, I broke it. Sorry, I, for my... Yes! Okay, push the wrong button. Please, uh, I, I pardon, pardon my French before. Um, so, welcome to Adventures in Publishing. Um, my name is Robin Chapman, and I was talking about that spectrum of very small to, to very large. Um, I'm glad that I'm moderating this panel, because I, I think I exist in, in both worlds. Um, I run a micropress called Paper Rocket that publishes zines and mini comics just out of my apartment for fun. So very, about as small as you can get and be a, a publishing company. Um, but for my career, I work at First Second, which is an imprint of Macmillan, which is a quite, it's a very large publisher. Um, so I have that background um, in the large uh, trade publishing world. And um, I use uh, she, her pronouns. It just so happens um, everyone on this panel does. So now, now you know. Um, and I would like to introduce our panelists. Oh, I did it again. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, so the first publisher I want to introduce is Ascend Comics. This is a very new publisher um, launched this year. And it's a, there's two co-publishers on the panel today. The first I'd like to talk about is Tanika Stotts. This is Tanika. <laughs> So Tanika is a writer with a background in spoken word, but um, has written a lot of a lot of, lot of web comics, and has also um, published and edited a number of anthologies. You may know um, this one, Elements Fire, a comic anthology uh, by creators of color. You can tell by the stickers that this uh, this is a pretty celebrated book. It won an Ignatz um, Award and it won an Eisner Award. Um, you might also know. This one, um, Beyond the Queer Sci-Fi and Fantasy Comic Anthology. This won a Lambda Literary Award. Um, and Tanika, I believe you're working on the next elements, uh, Earth? That is correct. <laughs> we just closed submissions. Excellent. And um, Tanika's partner at Ascend is Dershing Helmer. Um, you may know Dershing from her web comics. She's been doing web comics for over a decade. Um, this is Mare Interna, and also the Meek, and um, Dershin is working on an anthology as well called Alloy, an all ages mixed race anthology that I think is coming out this year. It's, uh, we should expect a Kickstarter pretty soon. Yeah, basically uh, end of this month. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, both, the, both Tanika and Dershin um, use um, the, some of the modern technologies that have come up uh, recently, like Kickstarter and Patreon, for to fund and market and distribute their, their comics and had a lot of success there. So hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think those platforms are real game changers um, for the small press. Oh, OK. Annie Koyama, you might have noticed, is not here. Um, Annie has a sore throat, and so unfortunately she couldn't um, sit on the panel. She was going to be coughing too much. But um, she's upstairs. Uh, stop by Koyama Press by her excellent books. We love her. OK, next up is Lionforge. Um, Lionforge uh, launched in 2011, and they've really grown a lot over, over that time. Um, and from Lionforge, we have Andrea Colvin, who is the vice president and executive editor. So Andrea, oh, Colvin, sorry. My, oh, I didn't even hear you. Okay. Oh, we didn't hear you. We were, we were laughing about the picture. Okay. <laughs> and she I mean, I got my that mean editor picture. <laughs> I got that from the beat or somewhere, so I figured it was, it was, it was official. It has a life of its own. <laughs> Sorry, Andrea Colvin, um, uh, Vice President, Executive Editor um, at Lion Forge. Andrea has a background with um, some large trade publisher, publishing companies like Abrams and Andrews McNeil. Um, so a background in um, the, the, the larger trade world, not just comics, um, comics publishing. Um, so Lion Forge uh, does a lot of different types of comics for a lot of different age groups. They, um, the comics here are from, from their young adult um, imprint, uh, Roar. They also have a middle grade imprint called um, Cubhouse. 
Um, it's actually Caracol. Cuphouse is now our eight and under imprint. Oh, okay. And Caracol is our middle grade imprint. Ah, good to know. I, I thought it did look pretty young when I when I was looking at some of those titles. Yeah. Um, that's that's very interesting. That's so, a relatively new development. So young adult, uh, just to to clarify, that's like teen, like maybe you know, uh, twelve to eighteen or fourteen to eighteen. Middle grade, we're talking eight to twelve. And then there's this eight and under group that doesn't have a name that everybody uses. Um, but uh, and honestly, there's not a lot of publishers that, that create comics for that age group. I think it's underserved. Um, but uh, uh, Lineforge also does comics for older readers, um, like their, some of their superhero titles. And you can see that they do licensed titles as well. Um, so just a lot of range um, and, and a pretty large company with a lot of books. So yeah. so. Um, all of us represent a lot of different places in the publishing world, and um, since I think most of the people in this audience are creators, artists, self-publishers, micro-publishers, or people who are thinking about maybe self-publishing or micro-publishing, um, so I, I thought I would keep our questions kind of practical about the, you know, what this what this work is like, what it means to be an editor or a publisher, how you can do it, how you might approach a publisher. Um, what it's like to work with one. Um, sound good? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah, let's let's I'm ask, down for some questions. Let's ask some questions. Um, so my first question for the whole panel: anybody who wants to answer can. Um, can you describe what your job as a publisher or an editor is like? Um, what are the tasks that make up your job? What is a day of work for you like? I am an uncertified therapist <laughs> uh, for various creators who would like to tell stories, uh, to manifest those stories in ways that are utilized through platforms, which is conveying it through comics. Uh, a day-to-day -day for me is literally answering hundreds of emails, uh, herding lots of cats, and trying to make it look easy by tweeting out my anger and pain. <laughs> Yeah, I'm good, yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, what she said, basically. <laughs> um, editing, I, I'm fairly new to it. Um, the Alloy Anthology is my first editing adventure, and I guess the one thing I didn't anticipate was how much time you're going to spend answering emails. Congratulations! <laughs> so many emails. <laughs> um, but it's extremely fulfilling, um, basically having you set out with a with a goal in mind, um, with your standards in mind, and then the rest of the time, like however long your book takes, it's um, trying to make sure you're maintaining that standard, and then also cultivating a, a good relationship with the artist that you're working with. Therapist. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, yes, what, what these two said. Um, certainly so many emails, and um, that you have to be really careful about not having your job be email responder. Um, so just so you know, sometimes I don't even respond to emails and I know it's terrible and I feel terribly guilty about it, but uh, that is because I want to spend time working with creators. So I think an editor's job is to figure out what, what first of all, find amazing stories and amazing talented people who want to tell those stories. Um, sometimes one comes before the other, sometimes they come in the same package and figure out uh, that person's process and how to work with that person to tell the stories best. So yes, therapy uh, is a lot of it. So um, it's, it's sort of, there's a weird dichotomy though, I think to being an editor, at least in what I do, because on the one hand, you're like way down in the weeds with people trying to figure out, you know, if this panel transition works or if it's messing up the whole flow of everything. And on the other hand, you're trying to figure out what the market is, what's out there in the market, and what the holes are in the market. Because um, I always try to remember that um, I love comics, and I do this because I love comics, but I'm also, to continue having a job where I get to love comics, I need to make money. So I need to publish things that are going to find their audience and help them to find their audience and sell. So it's looking inward and outward. So um, the next question I have um, is how involved are you as editors? Um, are you more hands-off or are you very involved in the whole um, early uh, progress stage of that script or thumbnails or, or, or there's a variety? Does it depend on the book? Um, yeah, just anybody who'd like to answer that? 
Neurotic. I'm very neurotic. I'm very anal. Uh, these are things that people know about me when they work with me. Uh, we start at the basics, which is your script. Uh, that comes from your synopsis and also your character information that you provide to us. Uh, goes to thumbnails, then pencils, then inks, then tones, depending on if it's a Pantone book, then color. Uh, for me, it is a very hands-on process uh, from every step of the way as far as the submissions process. You can't just be set in auto and just expect something beautiful to come out of someone. You have to respectfully be there with them the whole step of the way. You need to know their world, you need to know their point of view, their understanding, where the story is supposed to deliver and what it's delivering to the audience. So if you have that kind of relationship with a creator, that is the best place to be at as an editor and a creator. And I feel anybody who just lets someone go and doesn't check in on them that's not really editing, you're just curating, so change your title. Word. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mic drop later, don't worry. Um, I guess I've been part of a lot of projects with an editor, um, so I've been edited and I know what I like and I don't like, um, and starting to work with some artists, uh, I, I specifically set out to work with artists who um, were a mix of professionals and people who had never um, submitted to anything before, um, but were interested in getting their comics out there. And they had the um, the art chops and they had the story chops, but they had never worked with the editor before. Um, so for first time submissions, um, I wanted to make sure that I was extremely thorough with what my expectations were. Um, and the most important thing I think was making sure I knew where they were coming from on like a very high level of like what are you trying to communicate overall? Like what is what is driving you to even pitch this comic? Because um, I think if you don't have that, or if the answer is like I just want to make a book or something, or I get my name out there, it's like well that's not really you know what I mean. I want something meaningful. I want something um, that you are passionate about. Um, and working with people after that, it's kind of more just like as long as you can talk politely to somebody. Um, even when you have something really harsh to say, most people will be able to work with you because they understand that you're both coming from a place of passion and that you're trying to elevate the team as a whole. And nobody's going to be mad at you if you say, hey, this is going to make all of our work more beautiful, um, you know, even if it requires some changes on your end. And the clearer that I am with my critique and my expectations, the less of a painful process that is for everyone, I think. <laughs> no, I, I always say that, um, you know, this sounds a little wrong, but like, you know, every every really amazing project was painful to produce. You know, it's, you know, there's gotta be some pain to make sure that you're, you know, you're really making the best possible piece of art that you can. I'm, I'm definitely a very hands-on editor, although it really depends on the project and I work with all different kinds of creators um, some, you know, are very experienced, some are very experienced but have never worked with an editor before, some are debut, um, sometimes they, they bring me something completely finished and they don't want to go back and do anything with it. So it's really, it's, it's all over the map. Um, and I, I have definitely been, you know, given things that I really believed were 98% perfect too, and I mean, literally, actually, that happened once. And it's like, okay, here are my two comments, and you know what, this is amazing, go with it. Um, again, I think you really have to figure out what works for that creator, and delivering feedback, and the, the method of delivering feedback is, is really important, and the thing that I try to remember, and all of us at Lion Forge try to remember, is that for the most part, unless we're working with company IP, which we have a fair amount of, or something licensed, when we sign up someone's project, it's their project. And we have to remember that all of our feedback is in the purpose of you know, doing the thing that they're trying to do and helping them reach the goal that they're trying to reach. And so it can't ever become my project or how I want it to be. I have to be, as much as I'm very hands-on, I have to be willing to lose the discussion. Um, if, if the creator has a good reason for, for making the decisions that they are. So it's, it's an extremely collaborative uh, process. I think, except when it's 98% perfect. <laughs> um, so 
uh, for publishers, especially small publishers, it can be a real challenge to get these books in front of an audience. Um, so, so my question is, um, where have you found success <coughs> selling, promoting, and distributing your comics? Twitter. <laughs> Twitter's a really great venue for talking a whole lot of nonsense and posting some pictures and some selfies and having a really great brand for social media presence and awareness. Uh, it's one of your first steps into creating something called friends. Uh, <laughs> friends in publishing is also really amazing. You meet a lot of mm, writers, reviewers, pretty much librarians, the best people on the planet, um, and uh, various other sources of distribution from small distribution to larger distribution, uh, be it black box or be it something that's like automatic. Uh, these are your first steps, so you need to take them very seriously. Conduct yourself in a positive and generally good manner. Uh, if you have a shit post Twitter, excuse my French, uh, make that not your actual name and keep that one just on the side and maybe even lock it so nobody ever has to see it. Um, these, these are the ways that you conduct yourself and when I'm looking at someone who submits also to my anthologies, I, I, I seek you out. I find all your dirty secrets and your old live journals and various other things to know if I want to work with you as a person because I've never met you before. All I have is your story. So if I'm going to go in that deep dive, that's what I do. But uh, definitely social media. Uh, I don't do Facebook. There's no point. Uh, <laughs> Tumblr is kind of A-OK -okay if you just want to see a whole bunch of reblogs with no money. And then finally, there's Kickstarter and there's Patreon. I have both. Uh, Kickstarter provides me with 100% of the funding that I use to pay all of the creators that are in my book. I only keep the rights for a year. It's the Iron Circus model that we all know from Spike, and, and it's been very successful in changing the industry as far as publishing is concerned. So, hello, we have Eisners now, and Ignatz's, and various other awards that are being lauded to books that are small press, but we're making a big impact on people who would like to have these things in their hand. Same. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can just say same to everything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can't understate the amount of, uh, of pull you get on social media. Um, the other thing uh, that she mentioned is the branding, um, making sure that everywhere you are consistent, um, not just in your personality online, it's really important to moderate what you post about, but um, also just in terms of making sure things are linked really thoroughly, especially when you're at the smaller level and you don't have like a huge advertising budget, just making sure your links work <laughs> such a long way, um, making sure that you are cross-linked from all your various pages so that somebody who, God forbid, does use Facebook can find your Facebook page if they need to. Um, you know what I mean? Like there's, a, there's going to be people who um, who use the different ways of being communicated to. Uh, some people like RSS, some people like being directly emailed, some people like to see it on Twitter, some people, and you have to reach all of them. Um, so like when you launch a Kickstarter, you wanna make sure you notify everyone else who was in your previous Kickstarters, because they are definitely people who have bought from you before. You know, you wanna use um, all the resources that you have at hand to continue to promote your books, and then, um, and in doing that, you will also find new ways of distributing them, um, not just online, but you know, in the real world. So Lionforge takes somewhat of a different approach. Um, we spend a bunch of money on marketing. Um, and I am like, like that old lady who has Facebook and doesn't look at anything else. <laughs> so Tanique and I don't see each other online a lot. <laughs> But uh, delete but, your Facebook. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I know, I know, I know. But um, we, uh, although I, I do actually meet people that way because they friend me. But um, we employ people who do our, our Twitter and who know about this stuff. So as you know, an editor, I don't have to know about that, which is great. Um, although I do use social media and, and places and shows like this to find creators. Um, so that's really important. But Lionforge also invests really heavily in marketing. We believe really strongly that every project that we want to publish deserves to have uh, money spent on advertising, um, on, t on sending creators around to places like this and other shows, um, creating you know, postcards, collateral, what have you, 
it's um, it's something that uh, I think sets us apart. I mean, not necessarily from these guys, but from the big five publishers, where you can end up being, you know, a, a, a mid-list person, and um, they're not necessarily going to invest heavily uh, in marketing your book unless it starts to take off on its own. We're going to market everything, um, and that's how we hope people find our books. And it also helps if, if you make sure you do really good books. So if, um, if someone um, here in the audience aspires to be a publisher or an editor like yourself, um, what, what advice um, would you give them? Like, uh, how, how does someone get your job? And what do they need to know? What do they need to, and how, they, how can they learn it? So it really helps to, and I'm sorry I'm jumping in, it helps, to, it helps to know the market. So, you know, I've talked to so many people who, you know, people reach out and they're like, I want to get an editing job, let's have coffee. And so I'll say, okay, so what do you think is out there in the market that you really like? Or what have you seen that, you know, you think there should be more of? Or what publishers are doing a good job? Or what creators are doing a good job? And they'll be like, well, and they'll come up with, you know, this one summer, which, yeah, yeah, you know, but there's more than that out there. Um, so know what's out there. Spend time in bookstores, spend time in comic shops. Have a sense of what is being published, what isn't being published. Um, I also read books about editing, um, you know, and talk to other people about editing and get all of, we have 14 editors now at Lion Forge, and we get together a lot and, and sort, of, sort of share tips about, you know, what should happen in a book about giving feedback. Um, Cheryl Klein, who does not edit comics, she's a children's book editor who was at Scholastic and I think has her own imprint at Little Brown, now wrote a book, and I can't remember what it is, but it's basically, it's for writers, but it's great for editors. About It's just great advice about how to structure story, what you're looking for, how to tell when things are missing. Um, and then another thing is go with your gut. Like if you're into comics, and you, you, know, you read a lot of comics, and then you're reading something, and something feels off to you, it's probably off. You know? So you probably know, like, sort of instinctually. Who was that author again? Uh, Cheryl Klein? Right? Am I right about that? I don't know it. I'm going to look That's what I have, have Google for. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. It's, I believe it's Cheryl with a C. When you come back to me, I'll tell you the, the name of the book. Klein with a C or a K? No, Cheryl with a C. Klein. Yeah, yeah, but the Klein. C or K? K. 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 Google. I'm not getting internet down here. <laughs> no internet. Have a great day with that. Ooh. I'm a college dropout. Here, I'll just go into it. Um, <laughs> don't waste your money on college. No, I'm just kidding. Waste your money on college. It makes my job easier. Um, <laughs> I uh, got into editing through slam poetry. I actually cut my teeth on editing chapbooks. Um, I thought it was really cool. I liked E.E. E. Cummings. So, you know, I didn't capitalize things, and I thought that was awesome. Um, formatting rules? <laughs> Whatever. I'm freestyle. Um, and then I got into publishing comics, um, not capitalizing things. Doesn't really sell books. Um, not formatting, right? <laughs> doesn't really sell books. Um, very bad paneling or bubble layout process. Uh, these things are part of what people like to read when they spend their hard-earned dollars on, you know, physical product that they're going to hold. Kind of needs a little bit of professionalism put behind it. So, you know, maybe you should spend some time doing what Andrea already suggested, which is called reading comics. Wow! Um, so I got into editing comics by reading comics. Uh, not only that, but I began to take notes in my comics. I began to count out how much dialogue on a page and how many words fit and make for an easy digestion of something for a reader to read. I began to assess how panel layout and technique, and I began to fall in love with letterers like Orzakowski and Klein and various other people who inspire me. Um, I read the greats from like Mike Carey and various other people who made me think that 
this is how storytelling should be done. And from there, I created not only my own mental fortitude of how I would like to see comics published, but I began to publish them with other people. I'm just a writer, I'm not an artist as well. So I have a different way of how I visualize things, but I have other opportunities of visualizing with creators by either making thumbnails, doing SketchUp, utilizing tools that are available online, like hell, even The Sims 4, for building out an entire land and being like, yeah, this is how I see our characters kissing. And it was really amazing because the response was, oh, hey, you actually can see this, you can show me characters, and therefore I can go forward as an artist to collaborate with you and visualize further. So having these basic steps and being not afraid of my own confidence in showing my very terrible scribbles to somebody else was also another basic step of making myself a better scribbler. So start small, don't just immediately dive right in. And also always be a person who is not afraid to ask for help, uh, be a person who is going to be able to be accessible and also friendly to advice or criticism that is given to you so that you can hone in on your skills, make yourself sharper, and stab the hell out of the competition. <laughs> Um, I guess my background isn't terribly formal as far as art is concerned. Um, I, I got started in web comics like 10 plus years ago, so I've been around since the very beginning. And uh, one thing I love about web comics is that some of them are so terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're like some of the worst things you've ever seen. You and, like, hate read and a I, lot. I hate read so much. <laughs> like, I, but when I hate read, I don't just go like, "Oh, this is terrible." Like laugh at it. But what I do is I specify what do I hate about this, and I'll sit there and I'll write this giant mad essay to myself and not show anyone. But like. Um, you're doing that not because you're a spiteful, horrible person, which I, I may also be, but I'm doing it also <laughs> to learn. Um, and I, again, you don't have a formal background in this. You don't need to necessarily, at, at the, especially at this level. Maybe if you want to be a really professional editor, you should get some formal training. But um, being a, my own artist, being my own writer, um, and not necessarily having a formal editor to give me feedback, I need to give myself feedback. And the only way that I can do that is by um, determining what do I love and what do I hate and being able to explain that very clearly and if somebody ever points out something in my own work that they don't love or that they do love I'll be able to explain why I made that choice. You should never be making choices um, as an artist that are random. Um, they should be something that is directed and then from the other side of things as an editor um, you should be able to understand why are people making their choices and then is that fitting with the flow of what you're trying to create. You know what I mean? People can make a choice that you might not agree with on an editing level, um, but you need to really be able to explain why do I love this, why do I hate this. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. If an artist um, or a writer or a team of, of those things um, wants to be published by you, what should they do? Look at my submissions page. <laughs> uh, I have various websites. We have the Ascend Comics website now, which I'm moving everything to. But also, I just wrapped up submissions for Elements Earth. I also tweet about everything that I do, unfortunately. Um, and I make my life very public. Therefore, it's very easy and accessible for folks to submit. Uh, I also announce new projects all the time. And I'm looking forward to moving into a different direction of, you know, making more graphic novels pretty soon. Yeah, I, I think you really need to read what the publisher is putting out. Uh, if they've put out previous things, get an idea of what they're asking for. Um, if I'm doing an all ages book and I'm asking for submissions for that, like maybe the thing about gang violence isn't like such a, you know, where there's like people dying on every oh. page. Like maybe that's not the best thing. Like just please follow the directions a little bit and then uh, check out like, what are we actually going for? Like half of the submissions I would throw away are just people not reading the very basic bolded stuff that I had put on the submissions page. And it's really like, like why, why? Like I wanna, I wanna help you. I wanna put you in a book, but you gotta read the page, you know? Um, so yeah, that would be helpful. And then just also kind of getting an idea of who you're working with. Like who, what, is, what is the publisher doing? What is their vibe? Do you agree with their politics? Um, and if you don't, like, you know, look for another publisher because there's going to be a lot of smaller publishers out there who are up and coming who don't follow the models of the people who are more entrenched and maybe have a certain 
uh, a viewpoint that you can't agree with on a moral standpoint or whatever. Um, so that's what I really like about the smaller level of publishing, at least. So, well, first of all, lionforge.com slash submissions. <laughs> um, and Lionforge uh, publishes very broadly. We have everything, I mean, as you probably saw in Robin's slides, from our own superhero universe, but it's all essentially non-straight white superheroes, um, to you know, middle grade graphic novels, we're doing picture books, we do literary adult stuff, we do humor. So we're, you know, our motto is comics for everyone, um, which based, I mean, I don't have to explain what that means. <laughs> it's fairly obvious. So um, we really value diversity and inclusivity in everything we do, in the stories and our creators and in who we are too. Um, as a staff, so um, that's that's really important to us. If you have something that um, you feel has mainstream appeal, or if you have something that you don't think has mainstream appeal, bring it to us. You know, and um, if it's good, then we know how to find an audience for it. Um, so we, uh, I mean, what as far as what I like to see, like in a specific submission, people ask me all the time, like, so what do I need to send you? First of all, please don't send me an email with a link to your portfolio and say, check out my portfolio and let me know what you think. Because it could be like literally the best portfolio ever, but you know, this isn't college, this is like a business <laughs> now. So, you know, it's sort of like, how, how are we gonna, how are we gonna put out this piece of art and make money together? So I like to, to see in a submission, I like to have your elevator pitch which is you know, two or three lines about what the book is. It's like, imagine what would be on the back of the book. Um, then I like to have a full synopsis that I can read so that I know that things will happen and that you know what's gonna happen uh, in your book. That's really, really important. You cannot imagine, how, I mean, people could have a great concept, but then things don't happen and you're really bored. Um, and then uh, if you're just the writer, I like to see a few pages of script so I can get the, the tone of it. Or if you're a writer or artist or both, then I want to see some pages of sequential art. Um, so I know that, that you can do that. I think we're, I think we're gonna have questions later. Um, and, uh, you know, bonus points are, you know, if you, uh, like what would your book sit, sit well next to in the market? You know, like if you're doing a middle grade memoir, be like, it's, it's like Smile meets, I don't know, Blankets, which would not be middle grade, but you know what I mean? <laughs> something, you know, something like that. But that's not, that's not, it's great, but it's not necessary because I also say as a creator, you should be creating something authentic and you shouldn't be focused on what you think the market wants. Like that's my job. You should just be focusing on telling an, an authentic story. Um, I can't even remember what the question was. So that, 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 that was the answer. Okay, so just, good. <laughs> um, I, th I would like to um, open the floor up to questions now. Um, and, and we are going to end a little early. We're going to end 10 minutes early, so there's time for the next panel to come in, because it's a big one. Um, but uh, yeah, is any, if there's any questions um, from the audience, if you, they would like you to go to the back of the room and use the mic um, to ask the question. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. <laughs> um, so one of the things, I, like many artists, I'm fairly antisocial as everyone turns to me and I want to now get into a small box. Um, I've been trying to figure out the code for Twitter, like how to even know anyone exists there for two years now. And I have maybe 10 people who I actually know, most of it, and the others are bots. <laughs> I don't know how to actually connect to the art Twitter, the comic Twitter, or like, I hear about these hashtags and I look at them, they're all empty, or they're just robots. So my question is, how do you actually engage and socialize to start building a community, getting into the community and getting to know them on like Twitter and social media? I at people and I use hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> I create my own hashtags. Um, so if you see an empty hashtag, already drop it, but if the idea was good, make your own. Uh, it's kind of like also trends in artists kind of like calendars, like Inktober. 
very popular, very uh, known throughout all of society these days as far as like even off of social media is concerned. And engaging with your own local community. Do you have a comic book store that's in your area? It's a nice place to start and see if there's a local meetup of comic creators that you can start jamming with. And therefore, also making yourself known at any local conventions and just in general, being a person first is like way more important than being just a social media presence. Wait, let's go over uh, to, to the side. Tony? Hi. About like making money or like pricing books or? successfully. Um, I apologize. Um, so the breakdown of math, I could do that. However, that would take me um, much longer than we have for questions, unfortunately, right now. Uh, I usually do a, uh, a small little spat where I'll publish numbers, and that will go on my Twitter and also my blog platform, which is now Pillow Fort. Um, I was planning to do an end of the year report, actually, and that would probably be of more interest to you. But yeah, we sold out of Beyond One in 2016 after printing 3,500 copies. You can do the math on how $20 really adds up, and that was after 80,000 that was made from the Kickstarter, and that went to go pay the, uh, the creators, and then the rest of the money goes into something that's terrible and evil, and it's called taxes. So uh, while I could like run at the mouth and be like, yeah, we make money, like I pay rent, my lights are on, um, barely sometimes, but we're not swimming in it. Nobody who does a Kickstarter is a millionaire. 10% of whatever that total number you see that ends on the uh, account, that's gone. Uh, that goes to both Stripe and the processor for the credit cards and then uh, final out to the 5% for Kickstarter. So there's a lot in the money game and I don't feel like anybody's very quiet or tries to hide it. Like, ooh, we only need 20,000 to print this book. Yes, there's a reason why. And shipping will be the biggest issue you will ever meet in your entire life and will bite you in the ass it'll make you cry and you will never want to do it ever again and then you're like but I have another idea um so yeah a lot of money's involved and none of it's my money like eighty thousand dollars drops into my account it's not like Woo, I get to go on vacation now it's like ooh, I have to pay people so they don't kill me online um <laughs> So, you know, the money game is what it is, but uh, producing a book and knowing the value of the unit cost on it versus the wholesale cost, which is what you sell to distribution, uh, those are two big stories and much different. I, I, I will just say it's, yeah, and the guy's holding the rap sign, um, that I will, I will stand outside after this if people have further questions personally and want to ask me. I'm also really not good at math. I will be running away back to my table. <laughs> I think we have five more minutes, if I, my clock is right. Is that, is that right? Okay. Um, over here. Okay, hi. My name is Ramon Gill, Robin. Hi. Um, I've asked this question from Robin before, but I'm going to ask this for the panel. It's a little bit uh, a different version. Um, knowing that single issues have lower margins than trade paperbacks, knowing that floppy sold in comic book shops are less accessible than graphic novels sold in bookstores, Knowing that superhero books have a different audience and that graphic novels have a much wider range of genres and factor in factoring in digital distribution versus direct market, where do you see the future of comic books going? Where do you see this in like 10 years? Oh my God, it's like the huge open-ended question. <laughs> yeah, and also direct market probably won't exist in 10 years, but you okay, know, whatever. That's an answer right there. So. <laughs> or, or maybe, I mean, or they'll find a way to exist. I mean, I think, so... Here's a, a tidbit. We've got this um, big middle grade graphic novel called Sheets. It's been out for two weeks. There's some great sales velocity. Um, and this is, you know, it's middle grade and it's not, it's not um, single issue. 95% uh, of what we got into the retail market went into the book trade and only 5% in the direct market. Now, if the direct market decided to take a bunch of these books, it's selling really well. They could probably make some money and sell it. So a lot of this is sort of like the direct market has to figure out what kind of you know, stores or channel they want to be. Um, this right here, cast-offs, we started doing in single issues, and it 
totally tanked. The single issues didn't sell at all because this audience wasn't going into comic book stores. So we started doing it only in graphic novels and it's doing much, much better. So, you know, part of it is, I mean, obviously in, in the grand scheme, the, the book trade is gonna be big, right? Because now it's okay to read comics and it's okay for kids to read comics. So there's, there's clearly gonna be a big move into the book trade, but the direct market doesn't have to die. Yeah, it can. It's antiquated. <laughs> All things can die. <laughs> Nothing is finite. Space. Anyway. Thank you. Any more thoughts on the on the question? Um, and I, I th I, if I can chime in, I think one thing that we're going to see in ten years is right now, like we, um, Andrea mentioned, middle grade uh, graphic novels. This is a part of the the publishing market that, that is really doing quite well. Um, so it's growing year after year. Like twenty six percent growth year after year. And so these, the kids that are reading these comics now, like in 10 years, they're gonna be adults and, and they're going to, to change the kind of, the, 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 what kind of books are being created. I mean, you see it already, I think you see it, like when I look out across the audience, this is a much more diverse audience than was at SPX 15 years ago, a, lo a lot more women um, than, than I would, had saw at SPX you know, 15 years ago. And I think that's because, um, there was there was a, the influx of manga, and there was just and and so a lot the people who weren't reading graphic novels before, as children, got introduced and got hooked, and I think that's going to be even um, we're going to see a greater um, results from that in like ten years. So I'm pretty yeah, excited. Or in five years, they'll be teenagers. <laughs> and oh, make sure to have comics for them. Ten years in the future, jetpack comics, <laughs> comics yeah. that are just like. Psh like hell yes or you know holographic comics where you're like I can't even touch this thing anymore like we gotta have holographic comics I mean or robot comics like with an actual robot he just walks up and like pops open his chest and like read this comic and you're like no stop subjugating me um like I think there's an anthology in there. yeah exactly <laughs> like oh yeah <laughs> it's sex machine it's what Spike just came out with um <laughs> But like there are various things, and I think the future is amazing because we're we're molding it right now. That's, thank you. That's a great. That, that's a that's a great note to end on. Thanks so much for coming to this panel.